tonight it was just nice to hear. We're going to go find some more people. Instead of chasing people around, yeah. we're going to hunt. You guys are out hunting people now, and it's just a nice change of tempo. Yep, agreed. Fuck these people. All right, we're rolling down Lake Street. The first fuckers we see, we're just hammering them with 40s. Yes, sir. Is that a good copy? You want this whole group going back that way? Yep, so all we're going to do is we're going to take all of the strike teams, split them up. We're going to kind of stay together a little bit, but we're going to split up, drive down Lake Street. You see a group calling out? Okay, great. Gas them. So we can start that right here. On May 30th, 2020, at around 10 p.m., the SWAT team from the Minnesota Police Department responded to an incident at the Stop and Shop gas station where Sergeant Biddle directed his officers to approach and quote-unquote, let him have it, boys. Let him have it, boys. Let him have it. Get out of here. Without warning, the officers discharged their 40 millimeter plastic projectiles, striking bystanders, including the gas station owner and a Vice City news reporter who identified himself as press. Despite this, a SWAT team member forcefully pushed the reporter to the ground and another officer exacerbated the situation by pepper spraying him in the face as he lay there. Right there, get him, get him, get him, hit him, hit him. He ordered as the officers fired their plastic bullet launchers without warning. Right there, get him, get him, get him, hit him, hit him. Approximately an hour later, three blocks from the incident at the Stop and Shop gas station, the same SWAT team again acted recklessly, firing plastic rounds at individuals in a parking lot. Among those hit was Jaleel K. Stallings, a 29-year-old truck driver from St. Paul. Believing himself to be bleeding out and attacked by a possible hate group, Stallings, an army veteran, fired back with his mini Draco pistol, which he had a permit to carry, aiming low at the vehicle in an attempt to scare them off as he hid behind his vehicle to take cover. Here you can see that once Stallings realized that they were police officers, he immediately threw his weapon away and lay face down on the pavement. Despite his compliance, he was severely beaten, resulting in a fractured eye socket with officers claiming he resisted arrest. That night, the unmarked white van that the SWAT team was riding in with its red and blue lights off had an eerie presence as it crept down Lake Street, peering like a nondescript cargo vehicle. The officers inside wore blue Minneapolis Police Department shirts beneath black tactical vests. Behind the van, police cars trailed at a distance, having been instructed by Biddle to turn off their squad lights and maintain a slow pace. Damn it. Stop. 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 Call 1281 to the squads here at Lake and Hiawatha. No lights or sirens. It's like a slow jog in the park. Finding people. Marked vehicles are supposed to deter crime and discourage any criminal activity. The sirens are meant to do the same as well as to keep the public aware of emergency vehicles. It appears both were purposely turned off in hopes of getting closer to protesters in order to hit more people with plastic projectiles, sometimes called rubber bullets, or 40 millimeter launchers or rounds. What I'm gonna try to do, if we do have any squirters on the part of the building we can see, I got the long range one, I'm gonna send one down and send a few to try to push them to our uh, strike teams, yeah. okay? Before encountering Jaleel Stallings, the Minneapolis Police Department SWAT team exhibited aggressive and indiscriminate behavior, firing these plastic projectiles without warning at various groups on Lake Street. Their actions were driven by explicit orders to use force aggressively, and they displayed a cavalier attitude towards shooting civilians, often expressing enjoyment and satisfaction after dispersing groups, regardless of whether those individuals posed any real threat or were involved in criminal activity. <laughs> All right, there's nothing in here. Any rocks? Any yeah. rocks? Oh, yeah. There you go. I need <laughs> wait, wait, draw him in. Cushion Barry. Wait for him and draw him in. Draw him in and then hit him. Oh, we got 
gotta fucking. All right, start hitting them. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they got the back. They got the back. Damn it. Stop, stop, stop. Call 81 to squads here at Lake in Hiawatha. No lights or sirens. It's like a slow jog in the park. Let's find new people. <laughs> Parking lot to the, the north. Group of the parking lot in the north running. Hit him. Shots fired. 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 He's on the ground. Hold up, hold up. Hold up. Get on the ground. What's the guy? Get on the fucking ground now. Get on the fucking ground. You get on the fucking ground now. Get on the goddamn ground. Guys, there's a gun. There's a gun. There's a gun. Go, go. Twelve eighty one. Priority. Shots fired. Two suspects in custody. Gun recovered. We are at. Where are we? Fourteenth in leg. Fourteenth in leg. Fucker. Up to your butt. Do it up to your butt. Guns, guns, guns. Yep. There was a magazine here, too. There was a magazine, right? Is he sitting on it? No. He's there. He might be. Was it like a 9 millimeter? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was sitting right here. I think he's sitting on it. 1281 with code 4. We need that medical. Code 3. I'm gonna recover this. Oh my god. Yeah, because we're gonna we wanna we're gonna wanna test that. We'll just wait. What? Who 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 shot? Nobody, he shot at us. Anybody shoot! That's hard enough for all you okay. There's a there's that magazine. I recover a mag, who's missing one? No, 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 that's his! Leave that there. Don't touch it. That's theirs. There's two okay. guns. I have my gloves. It's okay. Did you touch it? I grabbed it with my gloves. It was nice okay, you're all right. You're all right. 1281. Get all those guys on me. On me. 1281. 1281. Anybody shoot? No. Anybody shoot bullets? No. Yeah, we all are out. Okay, I'm just checking. This is that's fine. Leave them on for a second. That's okay. Leave them on. I just want to know. Anybody shoot a gun? No. No. No one shot a gun. No. No. Copy that. Who no, was you Tom, are you good? I'm fine. Anybody get hit? Oh, right underneath my feet. Right underneath your feet. Yeah. So into the car, there huh? should be evidence in the car. In the I, yeah, it's something ricocheted off my left arm. So Kevin, there were the, no officers from 1281 shot. We were the first to engage. There should be evidence in our van. Bullets in the van. The door's open when he shot. So put 1280 to that, 1281 to that shoot. 100% no officers shot. Not on my van. And none of your officers are hurt, correct? That's correct. Uh, outstanding. Well, whatever. I mean, why is the, what, what he was resisting here? when we approached? Yep. And that's the way it happened. It happened. Got it. Okay. Hey, one of us? No, we, he didn't have it. We didn't have a shot. Oh, okay. Who got it? He was resisting. Oh, okay. Good job, guys. 
On July 22nd, Stallings faced a five-day jury trial overseen by District Judge Tamara Garcia. The prosecution brought the officers to testify, while the defense only called Stallings. Ultimately, he was acquitted of all charges. Stallings expressed relief rather than surprise, citing his difficulty in trusting the criminal justice system. The jury acquitted Stallings of eight charges, including attempted murder of police officers. Virgil Lee Jackson Jr. and his friend Jaleel Stallings experienced the consequences of police misconduct firsthand when they tried to surrender to the police, only to be met with brutality. Both Stallings and Jackson sued over their treatment. Stallings accepted $1.5 million plus legal fees, while Jackson's settlement approved by the city council amounts to $645,000. Jackson's attorney highlighted the unnecessary use of force noting that Jackson didn't even fire a weapon. Despite this, no officers had yet faced disciplinary action following initial media exposure. Deputy Chief Amelia Huffman referred the incident for further investigation, but accountability remained elusive. I heard what to me sounded like a gunshot, felt an extremely hard impact, hit my chest, which at the time, based on what was going on, I assumed was a bullet. In a recent Hennepin County District Court ruling, former Minneapolis police officer Justin Stetson has been banned from serving in law enforcement for the role in the 2020 assault of Jaleel Stallings. Out of several officers involved, Stetson is the sole individual charged. Initially accused of attempting to murder police officers, Stallings spent five days in jail before bonding out and was later acquitted by a jury who found he acted in self-defense. In May, Stetson pled guilty to felony and gross misdemeanor charges. He apologized to Stallings, acknowledging his misconduct, a rare admission in the context of Minneapolis police violence. If Stetson completes two years of supervised probation, the felony assault charge will be dismissed. Stetson's sentence includes 15 days in the county workhouse, although his lawyers are negotiating for house arrest. He is also required to pay a $3,078 court fine, enroll in anger management, abstain from using firearms, and perform 30 to 90 days of community service. Stallings expressed his satisfaction with the outcome, emphasizing that the issue extends beyond a few bad officers. He plans to use part of the $1.5 million settlement from the city to launch the Good Apple Initiative, a nonprofit aimed at encouraging police reform, signaling his commitment to fostering meaningful change in Minnesota. In court, Stetson, visibly anxious, did not make eye contact with Stallings during his victim impact statement, focusing instead on Judge Shareem Ascalani. Stetson's attorney indicated that there are currently no plans for civil rights charges in the U.S. Attorney's Office. And I was left with two options at that point, was to just be bitter and distrust all police officers or to be the catalyst for the change I actually wanted to see. My name is Jaleel Kevin Stallings. Thank you. Uh, so, I have my statement. Uh, my life was upended by Officer Sesson. Every aspect of my life irrevocably, irrevocably altered by his choices. He took an oath to serve and protect our community. In his official role as a police officer, he received more than 1,200 hours of training on subjects like de-escalation and appropriate use of force. Yet he found humor in mocking and literally targeting the very people he was supposed to protect. He not only did not uphold his oath to serve and protect, he couldn't even be trusted to obey the law. Unprovoked and without warning, he and his SWAT team shot me in my chest with a less lethal round, but he became enraged and believed his own safety was in question. He brutally beat me. I offered no resistance. I was terrified and assumed I would not live through the physical attack, but I did. Even though I was the one taken uh, from that parking lot in cuffs rather than my attackers, I believe I survived the worst. You can see in my booking photo that despite my face being bloody and bruised and my eye socket broken, I was smiling. I was relieved to, and surprised to be alive. I was confident I would be free as soon as someone spoke with other officers who witnessed my beating, I was sure that Mr. Sessions Mr. Sesson and others had acted so blatantly against their oaths and against the law that they'd be fired and charged for their crimes. And I'd be able to resume my quiet life in St. Paul, safe and surrounded by my friends and family. I wouldn't be smiling in that photo if I had any idea of the abuse that was still to come. I'm proud to say that I, I'm proud that I can say I made the right choices that night, given the information that I had in accordance with the law. I acted with self-control and caution to protect my community without injuring anyone. When a group of unidentified men shot me in the chest from an open door of an unmarked white van. I didn't know it was less lethal rounds. I thought I was being attacked by a group of white supremacists. And the burning sensation that I felt in my chest made me think that I was probably bleeding out. Yet, even in that moment, when I thought I was about to die, I applied my military training to, to take decisive action to protect those around me. I shot to disrupt my attackers. 
Afterward, when they finally identified the sets of police officers, I immediately discarded my legal registered firearm and took position of submission. I complied with every demand of the officers and I maintained that submissive position and stayed calm. Compliant demeanor even while they beat me and screamed insults at me. In contrast, this officer who was on duty and collecting the paycheck to protect the city the city, while it was at its most vulnerable, was unwilling or unable to control his, his urge to shoot at citizens unprovoked, to punch me in the face, ne neck and head, to slam my head on the concrete, and to kick me over and over again. The officer of the law who chose to shot at me without cause has lost control so completely that he complained afterward to another officer that he thought he had broken his hand. Imagine for a moment if our roles were reversed. Would I be sitting here accepting a plea deal that allows me to avoid permanent felony charge marring my record? I already served five days in jail with a broken eye socket and tits bruised and internal bleeding from this man's heart. I can't escape the fact that the system believed I was designed that I believe was designed to provide justice to citizens protecting my attacker, but not me. This theme will continue as we moved into my trial. Overwhelming evidence supported my truthful statements about what happened that night and I and did not support the story presented in perfect uniformity by officers involved. In this court, former SWAT officer Stetson admitted that he uh, that he submitted a false police report and lied it to the other officers when he said I resisted. Yet he and the entirety of the Minneapolis Police Department seemed determined to punish me. They seemed confident they wouldn't face any accountability and earnest to put me away for 10 years or more of my life just to cover up their bad actions. I've lived my life in a manner I can be proud of. I grew up well aware of the stereotypical image of a black man in America. I've done everything in my power to avoid becoming a statistic and to raise my standing and that image through the hard work we're so often told it would take to pull ourselves out of poverty. Despite the public consensus that is designed to work against us, I choose to believe in America's justice system. That smile in my mugshot shows my confidence that the system would work, yet at every stage of my legal journey, me and my beliefs were proven wrong. Other officers that night failed to intercede or even tell the truth about what happened, investigators could easily have made use of all the evidence available to see what really happened. At every turn in this process, I have been shown that justice and accountability are not the true goals of the system. As we sit here today, we know I acted within my rights. Yet, I was charged with eight felonies, a press release was issued that slandered me and destroyed my image to the world. Most media reported this story without first investigating their claims, and my reputation will forever be tarnished because of the lies of these officers. My case crossed the deaths of many people who had the power to put an end to my abuse, but not the intestinal fortitude to stand up for the truth, either because they were too afraid or too complacent to be the voice of justice. For an entire year, I faced a trial date with the growing feeling that it represented the end of my life. The closer that they came with nobody speaking up to defend me, the more I believed I was marching towards my own death. How can we say it's a fair and just system what is it set up to inflict pain and suffering and impose almost unbearable financial burden? How can we say justice is served when civilians are held to a higher standard of law than those that are charged with upholding it? After all I endured, to have only one officer involved to be facing any type of repercussion is a slap in the face, not only to me, but to the entire community. This isn't an issue of a few bad apples. While I love to say Mr. Sesson was a rogue officer or acting out of line, I now know better. The culture surrounding our law enforcement community needs to change. We saw body cam footage from that evening where officers in leadership gave commands designed to cause terror among the public, encouraging the, the type of behavior that Mr. Sesson is being reprimanded for today. In these last three years and a half, I've had a front row seat as a victim, suspect, defendant in my trial, plaintiff in a civil suit, and today I stand before you making a victim impact statement. I've learned that the systemic issues are pervasive in our entire criminal and justice systems. To be fair, there were good apples, for example, like Dina Winters, a local reporter stood part in an investigative report and published facts that called the officer's actions into questions. Um, it was on that same day that the MPD decided to launch an internal investigation that resulted in us being here today. The jury in my trial saw the same evidence that countless officials had seen in the preceding year, but they honored their duty to justice and unanimously acquitted me of all charges. By having the courage to stand up for what's right, they made a difference. While my entire life has been impacted by this experience, I'm also more fortunate than most. I can walk away from this experience of today if I choose, 
others who didn't have the benefits I had are in prison or in their graves. To honor them, I'll do everything that I can do to address systemic issues and improve the system so that others don't face the same abuse. Following my experience, I was left with two choices. To move forward with my life, to feel angry and bitter and filled with distrust, or to take action, I choose to take action. I accept responsibility for my actions and the sentence of this court. Thank you, Your Honor. After the hearing, I asked Stallings if he accepts the apology from the former officer. I don't only, again, because uh, I feel as if you're truly sorry for something, it, it would come at a much earlier time, not when your back is against the wall and you're kind of being forced to do so. All right, folks, here are my final thoughts. These cops were admittedly on the hunt to attack people. They actually wanted to draw them in in order to hit more targets. When protecting and serving turns into hunting and attacking. This isn't an isolated incident. The true nature of policing is demonstrated here. Remember the cop that was throwing sodas at people? How about the cop that laughed at the girl who was struck and killed by another cop from his department? And the actions of these cops here, especially Stetson. Sad thing is, Stalling spent more time in jail than Stetson. Stetson is the kind of cop that makes everyone hate cops. He earns the hate and distrust for the uniform. And there is definitely a disconnect between the Minneapolis Police Department and the people. But let's not forget what we just seen. Stetson wasn't the only cop out hunting people that night. Wouldn't this type of action be considered terrorism if they weren't wearing uniforms? Because it's the police doing it, they can call it something else? They attacked a gas station owner, a journalist, and many more people. People that had nothing to do with these protests. What kind of policing is this? Eventually, the lawsuit was settled for over $2 million between both men that were attacked and beaten. Will the people ever trust police again once they've lost that trust? What would need to change in order for the people to trust police again? We've discussed ending qualified immunity, police unions, and internal investigations. Three things that would immediately improve policing in America along with making these lawsuits come out of their pensions. Police say that there will be too many lawsuits against them because the people hate being held accountable, but the truth is the courts are full of people fighting cases where the cops seem to violate civil liberties. We've actually discovered the pattern of how this is happening. When we started this channel, we went out recording government officials as well as police. We began asking them all if they knew their oath or at least the five fundamental freedoms of the First Amendment and almost 99.999% can't answer it. This means they never learned the oath they swore to in order to get that job. All they did was raise the right hand and repeat something that someone else read to them. That means the person reading never learned it either. We've challenged our viewers to scour the internet for a video of a cop getting sworn in where he actually knows the oath, but that video doesn't seem to exist. This is disturbing considering the Constitution is what protects the people from a tyrannical government. It's no wonder cops scoff at the people when they say they have rights. They even go as far as to call people names like sovereign citizen. Next time you see a cop speeding down the road with no emergency lights or turning with no signal lights, Remember who really thinks the laws don't apply to them. They are repeat offenders. They run stop signs and kill people. They sometimes laugh about it. Video after video we see the true nature of police acting in the most grotesque manner towards the people. With egotistical attitudes, condescending behavior, and aggressive demeanor, they are turning this country upside down and they still propagate for everyone to back the blue. But remember folks, if there's one thing government does extremely well, it's to create the problem and offer a supposed solution. A quick eye opener before we let you go. We leave you with something to think about. Some states are advocating to let undocumented people become cops. We've already seen several videos of cops who can barely speak English harassing people. Soon. All you back to blue people will realize that you were duped and you eventually advocated for undocumented cops to have not just qualified immunity, but absolute immunity, like district attorneys and judges. Stop voting for your own enslavement. You paid for this lawsuit with your hard earned tax dollars. For every finger smashed by a hammer, for every dish served at a restaurant by a hard working waitress, for every local business trying to make it, these cops are throwing away your money. We are happy to announce that eventually Stetson did get charged and convicted after the lawsuit. I believe he deserves years behind bars, but I've always been a bit of a wishful thinker. We want to thank you all for tuning in. I want to thank the team for their hard work in producing this video. We're just getting started, folks, so subscribe and hit the bell. We'll see you on the next one. Peace. Hey, everyone. Today, I'm diving into a deeply troubling and important topic. The 2024 scandal involving police officers caught in a child pornography ring. So how did we get here? It all started with an extensive investigation by federal authorities. Over the past year, they uncovered a network operating across multiple states involving not just civilians, but also individuals sworn to uphold the law. Now, when we think of police officers, we think of protectors.
people who put their lives on the line to keep us safe. But in this dark twist, some officers wound on the other side of the line. The investigation revealed that these officers used their positions of power to hide their heinous activities, exploiting the trust placed in them by the community. Why did these officers do it? Well, that's a complex question. Some were driven by personal demons, others by a deep-seated sense of invulnerability, thinking their badges shielded them from justice. This scandal has shaken public confidence and raised serious questions about oversight and accountability within police forces. Authorities have already arrested several officers and more arrests are expected as the investigation continues. The public outcry has been massive, with many demanding thorough reform and stricter screening processes for law enforcement personnel. This is just about punishing the guilty. It's about understanding how such a breach of trust could happen and ensuring it never happens again. It's about protecting the most vulnerable among us and holding accountable those who exploit their power for nefarious purposes. In the wake of this scandal, communities are coming together to demand transparency and justice. It's a painful reminder that vigilance is necessary, even when it comes to those who are supposed to be our protectors. So what can we do? Stay informed, stay involved, and keep pushing for the changes that ensure our police forces are trustworthy and accountable. Thanks for watching. If you found this video informative, please like and share. And remember, awareness is the first step towards change. Stay safe and stay vigilant. Thank you.